All righty. Uh, okay, so yeah, uh, Mattia, take it away. Yeah, so hello everybody, I'm Mattia Mancini and I'm going to present you... Uh, uh, Guys, a bit of hush, please. We're starting. Everybody, please. So I'm here to present you our effort to make the love for data more accessible for the solar and space weather community. This is a work that we did uh, with Pietro Zucca and under, sponsored by Stellar and also Fuse. So the outline, next slide. The outline is the presentation is this one. Why we need to process the love for the archive, what is idols and what does that mean? And then we go to the second part in which we focus more on the, the Lofar Dynamics Petro. What are those? Why how Lofar sees them? And how, what can we do? What can we extract from, from this information about uh, uh, how can we improve the, um, uh, the current data so that uh, is more provable for, for this, uh, the wider uh, solar uh, community. You skip too much. So, uh, the LOFAR data is a huge catalog. It has been observed in the sun for several elements. Unpos unfortunately, unfortunately, the LOFAR data is very huge, and uh, to access it, you need to stage it for from disks, uh, from tapes, and that takes several days before you can actually access the data. And then you have to process it, and then probably you find nothing in the data. So. <laughs> Uh, for that reason, we wanted to improve the situation, and to do that, we have to uh, create a quick previews of the of the lower data, uh, and that is important to detect interesting physical phenomena, like, uh, for instance, uh, type three, which is very episodic, or type two, or type four radio burst. And uh, as obviously, more data means more constraint for semi analytical model models, and in general, to understand what what are the physical processes. They are going on. For uh, obviously processing all this data and all this archive is a lengthy procedure, and having something automatic that uh, that can can process all the archive is actually something that we needed, and that happened when when we started working on the LoFAR data, data valorization project, in which uh, we built this framework, which is called a TDB, that allows us to process every data from the archive using a standard uh, workflow definition. And in this case, we use the common work workflow language. So basically, any kind of processing you want to do on the data on the archive, you can specify it, and then there is a user interface that that uh, follows the processing. So it's really easy. And with this thing, we started to use it and create in the preview and uh, average down dynamic spectra with a windows of 15 minutes, so everybody can download in dynamic spectra. And we are currently working on a imaging pipeline. So the processing, the archive, the framework manages to process the data from the archive all the way back to the archive. And this is a small catalog that we have, uh, uh, that is now growing, that uh, provides a backend with a REST interface so that everybody can just script it and download the data. And uh, we are currently uh, creating also a web interface that you can see here. So basically, you go specifying what kind of processing you want to do, what data you want to do, and then after two or three days, you have the data processed there. So wh what is IDLS? IDLS is incremental development of uh, for lovers for space weather. and. Uh, what uh, we are trying to, we, what uh, part of this effort was to dedicate one station to observe the sun every day, so that we can have dynamic spectrum imaging and also during the night uh, study of the photosphere. So we always observe also a calibrator that allows us to do that. What this means, means that we have a, a, a lot of preview, a lot of data that keeps increasing every day. So. This is, a, we also have a live preview monitor, and this is what uh, it's created uh, uh, for the whole day, as you can see, and it's updated every five minutes, but we have also a last hour plot, so that you can see the, the tiny feature of the, uh, the type three burst. After a few days, we also process the data with the standard pipeline, so that you can have like, you can download the FITS file with the 15 minutes uh, blocks and also additional information directly from the website. 
But what, uh, what are we seeing in this dynamic spectrum? So we are seeing this t uh, mainly these t uh, three type of, of shocks. So the type two shocks that are uh, displayed like this in, uh, in our dynamic spectra so as a function of the time and frequency. And then we have a lot of type three created uh, by electron beams. And as you can see, they are very narrow in, uh, in, in time but they're very spread in frequency, so they appear as, as a vertical lines like this. And they actually, sometimes we observe all the time, so sometimes there are storms, and this, uh, this kind of uh, type three can be confused from, with lightning, because they also appear in our data. Another uh, kind of uh, uh, emission, uh, the type of burst that we observe is type four, that appears in our dynamic spectrum like uh, clouds. So here we can see it, for instance, in our sample how it looks like. So this is a type two, and you can see typically the, the, the first order and the second order of the emission. A type three, as I said before, it's a very vertical line. And what you, the, this horizontal feature that you see here are RFI that, that couldn't be removed. And if you go forward, and this is a type four. As you can see, sometimes what happens, actually many times what happens is that you have all of them happening in the same time. So you have a foreground emission of, uh, no, can you go back? <laughs> you have a foreground emission of the uh, type three and then you have like also a type four happening here. If you go forward, and in, uh, we also have type one storms that appears in this way. So you have like these episodic spikes uh, somewhere that pollute the whole image. So, as a first attempt, this is very preliminary result. It doesn't mean that <laughs> it works. So what we try to do is uh, uh, creating uh, a variation of the encoder. Why is that important? Well, uh, our goal was to try to first uh, uh, simplify the representation. For us, it was like, uh, do, can we represent the, the original the dynamic spectra with a smaller set of parameters? Can can somehow learn? Can we somehow learn what is the the RFI effect on the data? Can we subtract it or something like that? And finally, uh, having the, uh, smaller lattice paint, latent space, can we somehow cluster the event and the images so that it's easier than to for user to to say to catalogize them? So we started with a very, very simple uh, variational encoder. We have an input layer in which we, we go down in uh, resolution. Then we have a flattened layer in which we have a latent space that is distributed by uh, a series of um, uh, um, Gaussian distribution with mu and sigma. So actually we have two times 256 parameter in the latent space. And then we have a decoder. So we started training the model on 200 epochs with a batch size of 32, and this is what you see, like the evolution on time, as, uh, as you can see. And here is the, the elbow loss. As you can see, the, the, we have an initial transitional phase, and then the, the elbow loss uh, optimizes towards uh, a certain plateau. And as you can see, this is uh, the reconstructed images, and this is the original images, and the major characteristics are pretty much uh, matched. Uh, for a bit more details, as you can see here, there are these stripes because this was a preliminary way of uh, uh, targeting the RFI. So we took the whole data set, we averaged it down, and we saw that there were some bands that were like the more affected by RFI, and really flagged that bands in the in the learning. So the idea was that basically. We have an input that is uh, this one, and we match it with something that doesn't have those frequency, and this the results. That's why they, they are the current strips. This is far from ideal, and as a, but it was a preliminary step. In the future, what we want to do is that for each image we flag the RFI zones, and then and then of course uh, rerun re the, the machine. 
Like, how does the Latin Spains look in the, in the principal component analysis? So here we projected in the PCA with two components. As you can see, the points distribute like this, but many of the points go in the zero, zero space. So it seems like uh, the variational recorder somehow doesn't manage to see uh, the image uh, reconstruct them properly. The same thing, uh, so the same thing we, we see with the TSN uh, projection, but it's less evident. Anyway, um, if you go forward. Then we try to we use a supervised learning approach. So we started classifying the, the classes just last week. So this is actually another preliminary a the sample data set. We had the type one storm, type two, type three, nothing, atypical, which is something that cannot be categorized by anything before, and the type four. It's very unbalanced, but this is what we have. And I didn't want to group them together because it might confuse the learning process. We split the training data in 2000 for training, 200 for test, 854 for validation, and we had the, this network here. We added the, just two things to mention. We had a random translation in the time axis and a special dropout, because uh, a random special dropout, because that helps uh, overfitting, avoiding overfitting. And uh, this is the, the results that we have on the test set. Obviously, you have less categories, so, and uh, this is on the full data set. Obviously, the, the type one storm, type three, and nothing are pretty mm, well catalogized, but I wouldn't trust too much the type two and the atypical. Oh. So what now? So uh, for, uh, for sure, we want to increase the lab data, especially for classes uh, that are under sampled, and that's why we want to start a campaign in this universe, so please stay tuned. And uh, we have to, uh, obviously, as I said before, we have in the same images different phenomena that happen at the same time. So we have to try to segment the data so that we can uh, uh, isolate the different phenomena that happen in the dynamic spectra. Anyway, all the data is currently available. There is also the preliminary set that was used for this analysis, and, and it's available online. You can download it. The link is a few slides before. Sorry for rushing. And um, uh, so yeah, please uh, reach out to improve our approach and work with our data set because we need help. Because Classifying this data set is really important for us because then we can offer uh, data to the users so that they don't have to go through all the images every day. So this is my talk. If you have any questions. Brilliant stuff. So do we have any questions here? Uh, okay, well, we have in the middle here and then back front of that. Hi, nice talk. Um, you said first that um, when you showed the PCA on the latent space of VAE, it was not able to see a lot, the, the, the distinction between the, two, the various types. Uh, how big is the latent space, and did you try to increase it and doing either PCA um, analysis to see if actually you can see the differences with the bigger latent space? So what I tried to do, uh, so if you go back, it's 256 by the line. Yeah, it's 250 seats, the Latin space. So times two, because you have Mu and Sigma. So it's, it's fairly big. But I think the, the real issue is that it's riddled with RFI, so it, it struggles to find what is the data and what is not. And uh, what happens a lot, I, what I did actually, and it's not described it here too, but I was just curious, so I tried it out, was yeah. trying to use a decision tree on the, on the, on the Latin space to classify, to use the, the label data set to see if there was some 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 matching there. And apparently there is for the points that are far from zero. So that's why it made me think that probably is not seeing what, what I'm thinking. Okay, okay. So uh, you didn't try to increase, for example, the latent space up to, I don't know, 500 uh, points? Actually, we started with 512, and then oh. I tried to reduce oh, okay. it down <laughs> to see if I still can reproduce this, this kind of big feature. But if you, one slide before. Uh, forward. Sorry. Uh, again. So if you see here, this is a very interesting thing. So here there are type three in front, and you can see that it, there is a type one storm here that is not reproduced, and the same is here too. Mm -hmm. You see there are features that are not reproduced. So I'm guessing that that's actually the point. So it, it focuses 
on the foreground, major feature, but it doesn't reproduce the background. So I think there is some improvement there to do because you can always uh, remove it and then try it again. Okay, thanks. Uh, I think Shane was next, or, or well. <laughs> So uh, I always had the trouble uh, distinguishing between type threes and type fours, but I'm not an expert in this by any means. So as I understand, uh, the, uh, the uh, frequency drift in type fours are much smaller than the frequency drift in type threes, and this is how you distinguish between the two, right? Yeah, but uh, as, as you can see, he, he the, sorry, I have to ask him to go back all the time. But if you see in, in our uh, sample, you can actually notice it a bit more because like uh, you, yeah, it's, uh, these are average down data sets, so you don't see like the nitty detail of type three, but it's clearly uh, on the eye that this is like a more uh, cluster than a type three. Yeah, but if you see, if you see a cloud uh, of which you interpret as a type four, one might also interpret it as a swarm of type threes, so one next to the other. Y yeah, but I, I don't, I should show you like, but uh, usually this war, this one of type three usually it shows like this. I think for me the most confusing thing was between the type one and the type four because when you have a type one storm, it's really like uh, could be confused. Okay, okay. But uh, the data is public available, so it's easy to explore. And um, I didn't say this, but uh, to increase the uh, the background and the error in our calibration, what we use is a nonlinear. Uh, Processing function where we took like the uh, 20 and the 80 percentile and then we apply as um, a nonlinear function so that you can see basically both the foreground and the, the faint background because uh, we have a lot of faint type 3 that otherwise you wouldn't see. Yeah, I was just wondering could you uh, say what was the input for the convolutional neural network? Was it the full 15 minute chunk and then you just say? Yeah, average down, so basically it's uh, two seconds in time, and uh, it's 500 pixel times 500 pixel, because and we cut down the, the lower frequency. And, and so you get a one label for each of those, or a probability? Yeah, that's okay. the thing, so okay. to, to simplify, like to just see how it goes, because <laughs> it was the first attempt, I put a label for each one. But yeah, in the future it would be to add more label, and actually add a box around the, the, the search. But that's something that you have to either to label it manually or do something like, like you did. But <laughs> yeah, we'll definitely have to stay in touch. Um, yeah, just in the interest of time, I think we're going to keep moving on. But thanks again, uh, Mathieu. Yeah. Uh, everyone. yeah.